me in prayer. Yes. But you know what? Let's keep each other in prayer. Because the thing about death, people, unless the, the rapture of the church comes, 10 out of 10 of us are going to die. But in Christ Jesus, we transition. Amen. Better place, better body, no more bitterness. Amen. 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 So, Father, we want to pray this morning for John and the family extended. Lord, we know right now that the heavens are rejoicing because Her Carolyn's with you. And Lord, we pray for them. We pray that you would fulfill your promise to them. You said that you would be the God of all strength, the God of all comfort. Well, Lord, we pray that upon this family and upon this congregation. We are so grateful for every remembrance of Carolyn, her love of your word, of you, her, her, her love of us. What a gift that you gave. And Lord, we know that you give and you take away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. And the one thing you are not going to take is the eternal life that you have given her. She's with you rejoicing now with the angels. She has the crown of life. And we're grateful for that. So we lift up this family to you now in Jesus' name. And Lord, we lift up this Bible study too. Lord, we ask that you would bless it. Food to the soul. Lord, a lot of information, a lot of heavy things. But Lord, we are so grateful for every exhortation and every warning. So Lord, we ask that you would speak to us. Lord, that we would have open hearts. That we would have open minds that you would have our full attention and that, Lord, that we would spend this time now rejoicing in your word as we continue to celebrate our time of worship together. We love you and thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. We thank you for every gift. We know they're from above. And we just ask that this time would be a blessing to you now. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. For frauds and fakes, there is a lake. What? What, what? What's that? For frauds and fakes, there is a lake. Now, it's not a lake that you can water ski on. It's not a lake that you can sell a boat upon. It, well, it's not the kind of lake you want to swim in, if you know what I mean. No, this lake is described to us in the book of Revelation, chapter 20, where we read in verse 14, Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Please notice, for frauds and fakes, there is a lake. Notice anyone not found in the book of life was cast into the lake. Whew. Man, you had me worried there for a minute. I, I know I don't, you know. I don't have to worry about that one. I mean, I, I believe in Jesus, and, you know, I, I'm good. I, I'm, I'm real good, you know. Yeah, I, I've defi I, yeah, I sang the song, I've decided to follow Jesus. <laughs> Whoo! Really? What do you mean? Well, really? See, I can't tell you if you're saved or not. I can't see your heart. See, I can tell you for certain the words of Jesus and what He says about salvation and, and, and how He tells us that we're to be on guard. Be on guard? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, where Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wondrous wonders in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Well, notice the criteria. First and foremost, Jesus says, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, listen, the devil, the demon, they proclaim the name of Christ in fear and trembling. They ain't going to heaven. They ain't going there. But Jesus tells us the criteria. He says, he who does the will of my Father in heaven. He who does the will. He who does the desire 
of the Father in heaven. And Jesus tells us what that is in John chapter 6, verse 29. Look on the board. He says, this is the work, this is the will, this is the deeds, the desires of God, that you believe in Him whom He sent. You believe in Him whom He sent. See, that work, the, the deeds, the desires, the will of God is that we believe in Him whom He sent. But what does that mean to believe? You, you can write it down on the back of your bulletin, pencil, paper, and hand. To believe is to place your confidence, trust, or dependence in something or someone greater than yourself. To place your dependence in someone else. See, it's like a little child. A little child depends on their parents to feed them and clothe them and everything else. They look to their parents for provision, protection, leading and guidance. It's the same thing here. See, Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 7, He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. And what He's saying, and please, this is where the title comes from. For frauds and fakes, there is a lake. For frauds and fakes, there is a lake. Look at what the Lord says in Matthew chapter, uh, verse 15. Go up to verse 15 of Matthew chapter 7. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inward are ravenous wolves. You see, Jesus is talking to false teachers, false preachers, false believers. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus speaking about the last days, the end times, Right before he would return, what does he tell us? He tells us in verse 11, Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. That word false prophets, one word in the original Greek means false teachers, religious imposters, actors. Another was someone that, who will introduce destructive, destructive doctrines into the church. Someone who looks the part, plays the part, speaks the part. They look so spiritual. They sound so spiritual. But they bring in specific teachings and doctrines for the purpose of personal gain. So, so, so Pastor, what are you saying? I mean, am, am I going to get indigestion from this study? This is what I'm saying. Please note, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. What? Oh, absolutely. See? The first time is on you, but any time after the first time, it's on me. Why? Well, because I should have learned from the first time. I should have done my homework. I should have studied. And this might come to a shock to many of you here this morning, but not everyone tells you the truth. You've been lied to. Not only that, this might come to a shock to you. Not every doctor wants you to get better. They want you to be sick. Hey, you're money to them. You're a cash cow. Did you just call me a cow? No. I just, just... <laughs> you know my email address. <laughs> Not all grocery stores sell fresh produce and meats. You know, they color them so it looks fresh, but it's not. Not all car... Anybody sells cars here? <laughs> Not all called car dealerships sell slightly used cars. They don't. They don't. Yep, case in point, my oldest, Xavier, he was going to buy a car yesterday. He calls me up. He goes, hey, I'm looking at this Honda. You know? And I said, take it to Chuck. Let him check it out. He's rebuilt a lot of Chuck is back there if you're looking for a mechanic. Great guy, fair price, honest. How's that for a sell? <laughs> he fixed the church van. I told him, take it, take it to him and have him look it out. You know, just if the guy, if you say, can I take this to my mechanic? And he says, no, don't buy it. Well, he calls me up 20 minutes later and he says, we went back to check out the car and it wouldn't start. <laughs> what do you mean it wouldn't start? Yeah, the guy says it's a dead battery. Was it running before? He said, yeah, absolutely. But he said, the 20 minutes between me going to the, my bank to get the money, because he was going to buy it without having Chuck check it out, he came back and it wouldn't start. So you're telling me he left the lights on for 20 minutes and that drained the battery? I don't think so. There's a problem here. Take it to the mechanic and let him check it out. Otherwise, it's all on him. It's all on him. See, politicians, they lie. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. 
And yes, 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 yes. Some pastors and preachers, apostles and deacons, some believers do not teach the truth. And the first time it's on you. The next, or first time it's on them. The next time it's on you. Why? Because you need to search the facts. And you know what? And shame on you if you don't. Because it's all on you. But Pastor David, we thought we could trust you. Well, you can. But only if I'm being held accountable to the truth. There's a board of guys around here and all of you who have my email address that have no problem holding me accountable to the truth. And, and you know what? If I get offline, they have no problem punching me upside the head and say, come on, what's wrong with you? But just as I'm to be held accountable to the truth, you are to be held accountable to the truth. You are to know the truth because it's the truth that sets you free. And listen, it's only the truth of God's word that can do that. Amen. But a sad commentary today in the times we live in, not many people want to hear the truth of the word of God. Not many people want to hear the truth according to God. Why? Well, one word, pride. Pride. You see, pride. Pride, pride make, means it's like, well, I, I, I'm smarter than God, so I can play with my phone and I can do all these things. You know, I, I don't need to pay attention in church. I, I, I can mock God all I want. And see, if I swallow my pride and, 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 and listen and receive the truth only found in God's Word, then I'm going to be accountable to that. I'm, I'm going to have to make some serious changes to my life. So I'm just not going to pay attention. So I'm going to have a form of godliness. I'm going to say, Lord, Lord, and then say, So you will be responsible. See, the truth of God's words means you are responsible for your walk and the decisions that you make because as a Christian, we're called to be aware and alert. Aware and alert. Just like in the world, in the church you'll find phonies, frauds, people who pretend to do the will of God, but in fact they are only motivated by the lust of the flesh and, and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And they come to church to steal God's glory to steal your gold, and, well, to get the girls or the guys. These days, you don't know what they're after. But what Peter is doing is he's warning the church, 2 Peter, turn from Matthew, turn to 2 Peter, chapter 2. Look what he says beginning in verse 1. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who brought them, who bought them, sorry, and bring on themselves swift destruction, and many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words, and for a long time their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber." Now, remember, Peter, at the end of, of chapter 1, he talked about the sure word of prophecy, the sure word of God that's there to equip us to know, what is it to equip us? What we know? Everything you've been given. Because of His divine power, He tells us you've been given everything you need in Christ Jesus. Everything you need for life and godliness. You've been given everything you need. But the problem, Peter says, is you haven't discovered all that you have. And here's the problem. The reason you haven't discovered it is because of bad, false teaching. See, false teachers want to come in, and what they don't want you to do is discover everything that you have in Jesus. See, they want you to only know the limited things that you have in Jesus, so that way you will be tied to them. Well, we've got to go to Him to get the truth. We can't find the truth on our own. And unless we have the truth, well, we're lost. See, we need to recognize what are sound teachings and true doctrines of the Scripture. Peter warned about this and, and how Satan is constantly attacking the Word of God. Has God said? Did he really say that? Uh, is that what that really means? Well, that's your interpretation, but I interpret it different, and I apply this this way. But has God really said that? And listen, that's exactly how Eve was tempted and fell in the garden. Has God really said that? Well, you can tear it that way, but I interpret it this way, and you know, I'm good, you're good, we're all good, let's all just coexist. See, Satan knows our human weaknesses, and he exploits and seduces both men and women 
to fall for his fall. Well, what do you mean? Satan fell from grace. Satan fell archangel. Why? Pride. He was full of pride, which caused mankind, caused him to begin to covet. He coveted what wasn't his. He wanted what he couldn't have. He, men, well, they covet glory. Glory. Ah, oh, oh, it's, it's, it's me. I'm a great teacher, aren't I? And I'm handsome too. Can you beat this? You guys are so lucky to be here in church with me. They covet the gold. They covet the gold. And so that's exactly what we read when we read about this in Jeremiah chapter 9, beginning in verse 23. Look at this on the board. Thus saith the Lord, not the David. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, saith the Lord. What does he delight in? He, he, he delights in loving kindness, judgment, righteousness in the earth. And please, what's Satan going to try and do? He's going to give you a false sense of security based on your own abilities, whether these are physical or intellectual or spiritual. <laughs> You're all that. And if he can't puff you up, what he's going to do is he's going to turn the tables. It's the opposite side of that two-edged sword. If it doesn't work, he's going to make you feel inferior physically, intellectually, and spiritually. Oh, you're so dumb. You're stupid. You're ugly. You're this, you're that. See, that's what the devil's going to do. He's going to try and manipulate situations and circumstances to either puff you up or make you feel real, real bad. But Peter says, again, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, he says, Christ Jesus has given us all things to pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him. Listen, as we know Jesus, He gives us everything we need to have a great life, to live a godly life, to be who we are in Christ. See, Jesus has given, through the Holy Spirit, special gifts to each and every one of us. He made you a special you. He made me a special me. And the thing is, is what he wants you to do is discover who you are in him so he can use you. But the devil says, no, 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 no. You're better than that. Or the devil says, no, you're not that good. You're, 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 you're too, you can't, no, you can't be used. You're a sinner. Listen. You've been given everything you need, and God wants to bless you so much. And the thing is, is these deceptive teachers, what they want to do is to keep you from discovering everything He's given you so you stay stationary. You're in mobile. You can't go anywhere. And so Peter says, but there were also false teachers among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you. And Peter wants you to know that false teachers will keep you down, keep you in bondage, keep you tied to them. But Jesus Christ sets you free, and whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen. Now, how can you spot a false teacher? Because a lot of, how, how can I, uh, you're talking about a false teacher. How can I spot a false teacher? Well, and please, you have my email, send me an email. Turn on almost any religious channel, and there they are. Well, what do you mean? Well, there's some good, but the thing is, is there's more bad than good. How do you fall, spot a false teacher? Peter tells us the first way to spot a false teacher. In verse 1, he says, They will secretly bring in destructive heresies. See, false teachers don't come in with a business card that says, Hi, David Evans, false teacher. I'm a liar. <laughs> they don't walk in carrying a cat by the tail and having the book of Satan saying, open up to you the book of Satan, chapter 3, as we do our morning sacrifice. They don't do that. They don't come in and say, hey, good morning, everybody. I'm going to lie to you. I'm a false teacher. I'm here just to get as much money as possible out of you. So if you want to save a little bit of time and you can just catch the kickoff to the game right now, just write me a check, and if the dollar amount's enough, you're excused. <laughs> They don't do that. They don't do that. They usually come in carrying a Bible, 
dressed really nice or hip or cool. They carry pieces of paper that say degree in theology. And they're very spiritual. Very spiritual. They talk very spiritually. So compassionate. They are the self-appointed Lord's anointed trying to convince you that they would never lie to you. They use just enough of God's word to sound right. They tickle your ears. Oh man, that guy, it was 18 scriptures that he used, all these scriptures. I mean, it was just one after another. This is the, this guy's anointed. Just enough to seem right. But it's destructive, Peter tells us. How much poison is in rat poison? Does anybody know? Less than 3%. Now, if you were going to go out to lunch today and the waiter came up to you and said, what would you like? And you ordered that omelet and everything and said, now that's going to come with 5% poison. Is that okay? Would you say, sure, bring it on. I have a strong stomach, good constitution. No, you're not going to eat it, right? But see, that's the thing is, these false teachers, they mix in just enough poison to be destructive to get you off course. It's kind of interesting. Just enough of the word. It's a secret. Their doctrines are a secret. It, it, and their author is the devil. And what did, what did the devil, what, how did he tempt Jesus in the wilderness? What did he do? He used the word of God. He used the word of God. And he uses the same tactic to catch and destroy you. So how do you spot a false teacher? Well, number one, they secretly bring in destructive heresies. They work secretly. They're covert. They're lurking in the shadows. They, they come in kind of working the fringes. They kind of start befriending people and, and kind of start nitpicking everything. It's like, oh, I can't believe they sang that song. That is like so 1970. Really? I've decided to follow Jesus? And they start doing all this stuff. They start nitpicking everything. It's like, oh, did you hear that? Did you, what, what? And, and they do everything behind leadership's back. They're wolves in sheep clothing. They're teaching destructive heresies. You can circle that word heresies and write this, because this is what this word actually means. Dissension, discord, to divide. See, they, they want to divide the body. They want, to, they want to make everything seem wrong. They want to bring in doctrines. The, the doctrine of the rapture. Let's divide the church of Christ over something that's not essential. Paul came in and he said, Listen, I purpose to know nothing among you except for Christ and Christ crucified. Amen. See, they want, to, they want to bring in all these other things. Oh, oh, what about the tongues? The pastor's not speaking in tongues during the message. This must not be anointed. They want to bring in all these things. To divide. You want to know why we have so many denominations? Destructive heresies. Amen. All these little nitpicky things to divide the body instead of being strong in Christ, ruling the world. Amen. Isn't that scary? I don't care how much of a Christian you are, ruling the world. Christ rules the world. We follow Him. Amen. So they bring in these destructive teachings to divide and cause disagreements. And you'll hear them talk about the hidden truths of the Scripture. Oh, you go to Calvary, there's so milk. Here, let me, let me tell you what this really means. Let me show you what this really means. And, and they talk about these hidden truths of the scriptures that's revealed only to them, which you can have, which you can only learn through their teachings. Like, here's one of the ones these days, how to be a Christian millionaire. How to be a Christian millionaire. You can be a Christian millionaire. Um, a, the, a son of a pastor wrote a book, How to Be a Christian Millionaire, and his younger brother came out with a book, How to Be a Christian Billionaire. <laughs> how do you be, you know, how, how to be, well, you want to know how to be it? You buy his book and you buy his video series. He's a millionaire. You're broke. You want to be rich? Then you write a book and you do a video series and somebody else is duped into buying it and then you're rich and they're broke. Here's another one. Have perfect health until heaven. Perfect health until heaven. Oh, and you can only get it if you buy their book or their video series, if you go to their church, if you give to their ministry. I remember I went to a Pentecostal church a long time ago. I was, my pastor asked me, they had the Swedish 
um, Christian choir came to the United States. They were touring. It was a very strange thing for me because you had 60 blondes. <laughs> and they wanted to go to a Pentecostal church. So my, the, my pastor, would you mind um, leaving second service and taking them? There's a church in Pacoima. The pastor is Andre Crouch. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Andre Crouch. Wonderful singer. Okay, so he has this church, and, and I'm like going, oh, this is going to be interesting. I'm kind of excited. I like Andre's music. And so there I was, and I was greeted by the assistant pastor, his sister. And there he was sitting in a robe and a big chair that was all gold and a gold phone. And they moved, they did the, they did the offering, and they moved his chair and her chair, and both high back gold chairs with the gold phone in between. And they do the offering, and everybody stands up, and they go down. And these two big guys with this big, huge box, and they're putting it in there after they show it to them. And they either accepted it or didn't accept it. And the phone rings, and he's talking to somebody why this is going on. And I'm thinking, oh. This is different. <laughs> then the, the guest speaker came, a guy by the name of Brother Ash. And I'm always confused. Apostle Ash, Brother Ash, Bishop Ash. This is Brother Ash, and he's wearing like a, a Catholic robe, and he's got the thing, and he's got this big, huge cross. And I thought he was going to kill somebody as he moved because it would <laughs> swing out there. And I'm thinking, that's a dangerous weapon. And he comes out, and he says... By the glory of God, from his lips to my ears last night to you, you've never heard this teaching before. And I went, whoa! Destructive heresies. The second way to spot a false teacher, look again at verse 1 where Peter says that false teachers, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring themselves swift destruction. They deny the teachings of Jesus Christ. You know, their, their theology is basically Jesus plus circumcision, Jesus plus works, Jesus plus this, Jesus plus that, Jesus plus this, Jesus. it's Jesus and, it's not Jesus alone. And they say things in a way so you become enamored with them. You know, they teach things, and, and you hear this, I hear, you know, there are many roads to heaven, many ways to heaven. Jesus is just one of them. But see, they're denying the actual teaching of Jesus Christ himself because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But they deny, oh, no, 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 you just need to be sincere in what you're doing. There are many roads, there's many ways. Just be sincere and you're cool. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go by it. The actual Greek actually says, there are many who are on it. There are many people today that are on a road of destruction, and he's warning them, you can get off of it. You can get off of it. And he goes on, he says, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. The emergent church and many of the new reformers are now denying the cross, the broken body, the shed blood of Jesus Christ. See, being sincere is the modern atonement today. Yeah, the modern atonement for enlightened men. Be sincere. Be sincere. But listen, folks, they are sincerely wrong. Yes. And they are pulling millions upon millions of people right into the gates of hell with them. Third way to spot a false teacher, look at it. It says, many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. Again, false teachers will be very popular because they twist scriptures so that it's acceptable to the world. And the idea is being protective of people's self-esteem. Oh, we don't want to tell you you're a sinner because it might hurt your feelings. You know, we live in a society today, you know, 20 teams, everybody gets a trophy. Nobody loses. The first place trophy is this big. The 20th place trophy is this big because everybody feels good. We don't have to work for anything. We want to self-indulge and hand everybody everything. We don't want anybody to work for anything because, well, they might not feel good. So instead of telling people that they're in need, telling them they're sinners, they just send them home feeling really good about themselves. 
The fourth way to spot a false teacher is by covetousness. He says, by covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. Notice he doesn't say, by covetousness, we'll exploit us. He says, no, they'll exploit you. These false teachers, they're not stealing from, any, from each other. They're stealing from you. They're stealing from you. See, false teachers want your stuff. They want it. They want what you have. And to get it, they exploit you with deceptive words. Seducing words. Words that make you believe one thing when the scriptures say something completely else. You know what? Anyone this morning writing a check for $10,000, God is speaking to me right now. He's going to give you 30, 60, 100 fold. How good is your faith? You write that check and I guarantee you in a week, someone will end up with 30,000, someone 60,000, someone $100,000. See, they want you to want what other people have. All right, you like my Rolls Royce? You like my Bentley? You like my Ferrari? You can have it too. How's your faith? You lack faith. You need to write that check. And guess what? Our credit card machines are ready to roll because you can charge it. <laughs> See, they tell you the only way to get is to give. See, that's Jesus and. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God loves you that he will give you everything you need for life and godliness. Want to get out of debt? Give. Got a debt crisis? That's okay. You can spend your way out of it. <laughs> what? Circle that word exploiting and write make merchandise of. Trade in, exhort, or emporium. See, what Peter is saying here is he's saying exactly what Jesus said. Remember when Jesus, he came into the temple proper area and he saw all these guys changing money, selling birds and all this stuff. And he, he got a little, you know, I'm not going to say upset, but a little righteous indignation. He started turning over the money changer's hand, letting all the birds and stuff go. And he says, my father's house is a house of prayer and you have made it a place of merchandise. You've turned the church into Walmart. And that's okay with you. Circle that word deceptive and write plastic. Plastic. So that's the Greek word is where we get our English word plastic. They use plastic words and they look plastic. You know what I mean? It's like you're thinking, didn't he have gray hair last week? And something's different. They're always changing to entice. You know, when I was a kid, the whole thing, plastic was bad. Oh, they're plastic. Plast if you were a plastic person when I was a kid, it meant fake. You were fake. And that's what Peter's saying. They're just fakes. They're fakes and frauds, and there is a lake. And Peter reminds us the fate of those that will happen to those false teachers. He says, look, he says at the end of verse 3, For a long time their judgment has not been idle. And their destruction does not slumber. See, these false teachers are deceiving themselves into thinking that they're not going to be judged. See, many people, they believe and look at success or lack of God's judgment to be God's approval of any of these kinds of actions. Well, I mean, you know, come on. I mean, it's like I've been doing this for all so long. I've been living in this and, you know, doing this and doing that. And look, where's God's judgment? He, it's not God's approval. See, don't look at a lack of judgment as God's approval of these kinds of actions. You should never mistake God's grace for God's approval. And, it's, and Peter tells us that the judgment's not idle. It's working. It's happening. It, it's going on right before your very eyes. You just haven't felt it yet. Well, what do you mean? Well, for those that do these kind of things, Jesus said in Luke chapter 17, beginning in verse 1, he says, It is impossible that no offense should come. But woe to him through whom they do come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into sea that he should, be, that he should offend one of these little ones. What? I, I don't get it. Well, Jesus is saying, listen, human beings with good intentions are going to blow it. Maybe, you know, I'm married. You guys know my wife. She's my better half. And uh, there are times that I've wanted to do really nice things for her or for my family. 
and well, it just kind of blows up in my face. I had great intentions, and it, the execution just kind of went <laughs> Does that happen to anybody? Am I the only one here? Okay, so listen, if, you, if, you, if you're off just a little bit, that's sin, missing the mark. And so Jesus said, you're going to have great intentions, you're going to want to do well, but you're going to offend. You're going to offend. You're going to sin. But he says, woe to anyone that causes anyone to sin. It would be better if they would have never known the truth. Why? Because God's not sleeping. God doesn't slumber. No, God is working, and through God, and though God, though He doesn't take pleasure in judging or the destruction of the wicked or the loss of one's soul, though God is holding back His hand of judgment, waiting for those who would repent, though He does not judge, here's a simple fact that you guys all need to understand. And if you get this down and never come back and you understand this principle, you will do well your whole life. When God created the universe, He set in motion the laws of sowing and reaping. Okay? Sometimes it takes longer for other seeds to germinate and grow. And so the seeds of sowing and reaping are going on right now. Whatever you sow, you will reap. You cannot plant an apple seed and get an orange tree. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap. It might not be today, but five years from now when it happens, don't clench your fist at God. And so what he's telling us is God's judgment isn't idle. It's not sleeping. It's happening. So be sowing seeds of righteousness because even though you might be going through a trial or a little bit of trouble in your life, it's momentary. Those seeds will bring forth fruit. Well, beginning with verse 4, Peter will give us three examples of God's judgment and how it wasn't idle and how it didn't slumber. And he wants to show that if God judged in the past, he's going to judge in the future. Look at verse 4. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and deliver them into chains of darkness. And that word darkness isn't just any kind of darkness. It's like called black darkness. Black, black darkness, which is really dark. To be reserved for judgment. Now, that word hell here is Tartarus, and it's the only time it's used in the New Testament ever. Tartarus literally means a place of captivity or a holding cell. You know, God, when the angels, and, and most people believe that he's referring to Genesis 6, where the angels left their first estate and went down and, and did something with the, the daughters of men. Uh, some kind of sexual sin. There's a lot of controversy and a lot of stuff. We could be here for a week just on that one thing. But what is important and what we need to understand is that Peter begins to lay out God's history of judging disobedience. And if he's going to judge the angels, and I don't know anybody here who's greater than an angel. Any, any, if you're an angel, can you please raise your hand? Because the Bible says that you might be in our midst. No angels? Okay, so they're, they're greater than us, okay? If he's going to judge them because of their rebellion, what makes us think God won't judge our disobedience and rebellion? I mean, are, 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 are we, do, do we really, you know, are we all that? I'm no angel. And you know that because you send me emails telling me that. <laughs> in verse 5, Peter gives us a second example of God's judgment in human history. In Noah, look what he says, And did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. Now, most people estimate that there was probably between 6 and 14 billion people, depending on who you want to believe, but there's a lot of people on the earth. And it says that he did not spare the world, only Noah and his family. So out of, let's just say, 8 billion people, only 8 were saved from God's judgment. Now here's the thing about that. Anyone could have got saved. The ark was big enough. They all could have got on it. They all could have been saved. Anyone can get saved. If you're not saved here this morning, you can get saved. It's a wonderful thing to be set free from the world and sin. It's a great thing. 
to start your life over. I love do-overs. I love, and God is the greatest do-over there is. But anyone could have got saved. But only eight did get saved. Noah was a preacher of righteousness, and everybody thought he was a crackpot, a nut job. You know, for 120 years, he's building this ark, and people are going by going, what is this? It's going to rain. What's rain? Oh, it's kind of like me spitting on you. <laughs> they, they didn't know what rain was. There was never any rain. And so here is this guy building an ark, and after 100 years, they started having, you know, Ark Day. We have Veterans Day and Memorial Day and all that stuff. You know, they had Ark Day. Hey, he's a crazy guy. Yeah, ark Day. Let's, let's, let's. Let's have a party about the crazy guy. But God tells us in Genesis 6, 5, exactly how the world was at that day. When he tells us, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Boy, I'm so glad I don't live in a world like that. I'm glad I don't live in a world that's full of violence and sexual morality. I'm glad I don't live in a world that's that's being influenced by demonic forces. I'm so glad I don't have to contend in a world where jails and malls and football stadiums are fuller than churches. I'm glad, aren't you glad? And see, the point that Peter's making is the whole world was judged. They didn't get away with their ungodliness. They all perished, all except for eight people. And Peter's third example, look at verse 6. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly, and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked, for the righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to night by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds." Our problem is we see and hear lawless deeds, but it doesn't even affect us anymore. You know, it's like living in New York City. Oh, somebody just shot somebody. Oh, oh, there you go. Oh, there's that. Hey, oh, somebody broke in. It's like if you don't hear the, the noise of the city, if you don't hear the fire engines and the police and all this, you can't sleep. It's too quiet. Where's all the lawlessness? This man was tormented, he tells us here. Now, the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah, a lot of people will say was unrestrained homosexuality. And I'm going to say, no, it wasn't. Oh, he's a false teacher. No, no, it, it wasn't. You want to know what the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was? Ezekiel 16, verse 49. Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. This is, the sister is uh, Gomorrah. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, and an abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen her hand of the poor and needy, and they were haughty and committed abominations before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw fit. Did you see what the sin of Sodom was? It's the same thing that was the sin of Satan. They were prideful. This word prideful is the idea of self-exaltation. You see, they, they were patting themselves on the back for their wealth and for their, their, their military power and their prowess and their, their buildings. Oh, look at our buildings. Look at this great structure. They thought they did it all by themselves. Secondly, they had fullness of food. You know, they overcooked and they overate. I don't know anything about that. <laughs> Overcooking and overeating. See, they threw away more food than most families eat in a week with each meal. See, their, their, their security was based on how much food was in the refrigerator and the pantry. He says they had idleness, an abundance of idleness. They had time on their hands. And what do we say? Idle hands are the devil's workshop. See, the word idleness means dropped down. It's a really interesting Hebrew word. It literally means lounging. See, they, 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 they were so secure in that the government would give them everything that they needed. They didn't have to work. They didn't have to worry about national security. You know, they just were going to drop down and hang out and wait for the stuff. <laughs> they didn't have to worry about food or anything. They had time on their hands. They could play on the internet, Xbox. 
But the problem is they got bored. And, you know, boredom is the root of many a person's problems. In, in, in case, you know, if you've ever been bored, you start doing things you wouldn't normally do. You know, you're bored? Yeah, kick the dog. Kids might be fun. In this case, they didn't kick the dog. They started taking it out on the poor and the needy. So they got nothing to do. And finally, Ezekiel says they committed abominations. And, and, and what that made that worse is they were haughty about it. Now, the idea of about abominations is it goes against the schematic. See, God has a plan. And he says, this is how things work. And what they were saying is, no, we don't agree with you, God. We're going to go against the schematic and do it our way. And we're going to be blatant and we're going to be prideful about it. So they were forward in their actions, and so God judged them. Now, there is what they call, and it's kind of an interesting thing, uh, a rift valley that goes from Syria all the way down into Africa, right through the Dead Sea. Now, most people, most biblical scholars believe when God judged them, he cracked the earth judging them. Boom! <laughs> he broke the earth. <laughs> Now, here's the thing, and some people are probably mad at me right now, but if you really love someone, do you tell them the truth? Do you tell them what the Bible says, giving them the opportunity to choose to do what the Bible says or to choose what they want to do? See, God says he delivered Lot, pulling him out like a bad tooth. And, and Peter is very kind to Lot here, but God saved Lot out of Sodom and Gomorrah. And so if we can see that God can save Lot and judge the wicked, He wants to save us. He wants to pull us out. But we have to choose to do that, and you can only choose if you know the basis of what is truth and what is not. Well, look what he says in verse 9. Knowing that the Lord, he's basically saying God knows how to judge. And then in verse 9, then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment, especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lusts of uncleanliness and, desire, and despise authority. They are presumptuous, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries, whereas angels who are greater in power and might. See, I didn't just say that earlier. They're, they're greater than us. God says it. Do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. Beginning with verse 10, Peter gives a list of characteristics of those frauds and fakes that are on a crash course with God's judgment and a very hot lake. The first thing that Peter mentions here is they walk according to the flesh. The flesh. These frauds are characterized by being fleshly. Fleshly. What do you mean by fleshly? We're all fleshly. We're covered in flesh. Circle that word fleshly and write carnal, earthly, or temporal, temporary. See, their, their, their minds, their ideas, their desires are always on physical things and not spiritual things. They're concerned about physical things. Everything revolves around the need of the now, the need of the flesh. I'm hungry now. I can't deny myself. I must eat Krispy Kreme donuts. In contrast, though, Paul tells us in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, he said, listen to what Paul says. He says, if then you were raised with Christ, if you're a born-again believer, seek those things which are above, Amen. where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not things on the earth. Now, do you get the idea, the real deal Christian should be looking below? Or looking above? What should our focus be on? You know, should, should we be forward thinking or earthly bound? Where's our treasure supposed to be based on what Paul's saying here? Is our treasure in heaven or on earth? And the thing is, is as we put our hearts and our treasure above, God takes care of everything below. But see, we're so focused on what's below, we're missing out. Remember false teachers? They, they don't want you to discover what you have. They want to keep you from that. And so they're going to tell you, oh, no, 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 you need this, you need this, you need this, you need this. And God's saying, no, 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 no. You need me, you need me, you need me. Amen. And so if you seek me and my righteousness, everything else will be added to you. 
No, 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 no. You need to listen to me. I know. But get, get your checkbooks out. It's all going to be okay come tomorrow. Trust me. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. What else? Notice they despise authority. And that's all authority. Not just man's authority. And just so we all are understanding, Romans 13 tells us that there is no authority except for that which is given by God. Amen. Sometimes He gives us what we deserve. And that isn't good. All authority, and, and, and mostly he's talking about God's word, because God's word is the ultimate authority given to mankind, and they despise it. See, they elevate their own ideas and their own meanings above God's word, you know, their own intentions. And you hear it in all these churches, and boy, people eat it up, and they're growing and exploding. And, and See, God doesn't need someone or hasn't called anyone to explain away His Word. God calls us to simply teach the Word. Simply teach the Word. Next we see that they're presumptuous. Presumptuous. That's a big word, and I think that should be the word today. Everywhere you go, oh, don't be so presumptuous. Is that kind of like a chick word? Presumptuous? <laughs> oh, Bob, you're so presumptuous. That whole idea of presumptuous is they're bold and open about the freedoms to engage in any kind of sin. They're presumptuous. Oh, it's okay with God. So they're just open about it. They're just flagrant. And he says they're self-willed. Circle that word self-will and write stubborn, arrogant, or to please self. It's literally not thy will, but my will. Oh, Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? <laughs> not... Thy will, but my will be done on heaven and on earth. Now, it's kind of interesting because isn't my will be done? Wasn't this Lucifer's sin in Isaiah chapter 14 where Satan tells us his plans, his wills, and we have the seven I wills which outlined his rebellion and his desires? And so many times we'll say the words, Oh, not my will, but thy will will be done. But we really don't mean it. We really don't. And some of you are saying, yeah, I've done that because I knew what I wanted and I said, not my will, but thy will, but I really wanted my will. It's true. Look at verse 12 as we continue. But these, like natural brute beasts, made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of the things they do not understand and will utterly perish in their own corruption and will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. They are spots and blemishes carousing in their own deception while they feast with you. Here Peter tells us that there's nothing godly or divine about these false teachers. In fact, we're told that they've elevated their own imaginations and agendas above God's word and God's plan. And, and, and in doing so, they have lowered themselves to what Peter calls natural brute beasts made to be caught and destroyed. What do you mean? Well, literally, what he's saying is they're like a cow on its way to become a Big Mac. Did he just call me a cow? No, 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 no. These false teachers, they're just like a brute beast or like a cow or a pig or any kind of animal ready to be destroyed and eaten. So when you go to Big Burger King or McDonald's or somewhere after church, you can say, oh, look, a false teacher. <laughs> Dig in. <laughs> and see, what he's telling us is they have no clue that what they're saying or doing is wrong. Why? Because they've been blinded by pride and, and, and they hide behind words. You know, see, they use Christian lingo. They use the oh, grace. Where's your grace, brother? Oh, don't judge me lest ye be judged. There was a guy who called me on Friday. He was having an interfaith uh, Thanksgiving service in a week from now and he's met somebody at the store and invited them to it and called me up and he said, we'd love you to participate. And I said, well, who's going to be there? Well, we have the Mormons that are going to be there. We have, we, we have the Islam that's going to be there. We have the Catholics that are going to be there. We have all, Methodists and all these other things. I said, did you invite the Church of Satan? <laughs> he goes, oh, brother, what are you talking about? I said, they're a faith. He goes, oh, that's true, but come on. I said, well, wait, but wait a minute. See, we're called to exalt the name of Jesus. And you have people there that are going to be celebrating not Jesus. They don't believe in Jesus. 
And how can I participate in that? You, you tell me it's all about Jesus and you have people there that are on fire about Jesus. I don't care if they're Methodists or any of these other things, but you have a group of people that are going to say, okay, let's pray. Mary, would you please intercede on our behalf to Jesus? There's no, there's no intermarry between, there's nothing between us and Jesus. Now, I'm not putting that down, but I'm just saying we have to be careful because that's not a celebration of Jesus. That's a celebration of coexistence. They're blinded. They're blinded by their pride. See, he wants to do this. He wants to build this thing. And he says here that, and I kind of love Peter. He says, having eyes full of adultery in verse 14 that cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. They have a heart trained in covetous practices and are accursed children. So you have like, you know, Taekwondo and karate and uh, covetous practices. They're trained in covetous practices. That's, That's what they're learning. That's what they're doing. And this is what we call clarity teaching. Paul or Peter here, he knows he's about to die. And so he is unloading and exposing everything that he's seeing and hearing. He's unloading it all. You know, do you remember that painting by numbers stuff? That's what he's doing. He's painting by numbers what a false teacher is, what false preaching is, what you need to be looking out because these are the end times. And he's saying, listen. There were false preachers in the days of Israel. There's false teachers today. And if you buy into this, they will drag you down with them. And you're a goodwill person, blub, 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 blub. They, they, they don't even realize what they're doing. They're blinded by pride. And, and so much so, they become addicted to that pride that they cannot cease from sinning. They can't cease. They can't stop. And they're preying on the weak and gullible. Did you see that? They're enticing unstable souls. These are new Christians. These are unstable, unlearned Christians. People that have, like, they may, you may be saved for 20 years, but you don't know the Word of God, and so you're being deceived and being pulled into these deceptions. And that's why I say, listen, get a Bible, take a Bible, read the Bible, know the Bible, know who Jesus is, and you do well. You don't need me. I don't feel love now. <laughs> Look what he says in verse 15. They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of righteousness. But, and he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice restrained the madness of the prophet. That's what the church needs. A few more willing donkeys to speak up. We can't get people to speak up, so let's get us some donkeys. Now, Balaam was a prophet. The, the scriptures, and we read about him, uh, primarily this is, this is out of Numbers chapter 22. It says he was a prophet of God, and he goes wrong. Now, he loved money. And what's important to understand is that God showed Balaam the right way. Balak comes to him and says, hey, I need you to curse these children of Israel. They're like gnats. They're like grasshoppers. There's just too many of them. Curse them so they die. And so he thinks, yeah, money, all right. God tells him, don't go, don't do it, don't do it. But, you know, he has a choice. He has a choice. So though God warned him not to go, well, he found a way to go. And on his way to go, here's this donkey. And donkey sees an angel, angel of the Lord with a sword. You know, I don't know if he's a switch hitter. I don't know what hitter. But either way, he was ready to take Balaam's head right off. So the donkey starts pushing up against the the side of the road, trying to, you know, and finally the donkey lays down. Balaam, if I had a sword, I'd kill you. And the donkey goes, what? (laughs) Have I ever been a disobedient donkey? Haven't I always been good? Haven't I always been, you know, behaved and all this stuff? Now, it wasn't that the donkey spoke. I mean, that's kind of, you know, he wanted to kill the speaking donkey. Me, I'm marketing, you know, hey, church needs a new building. A speaking donkey, come and check it out. But the real funny thing about this is the prophet spoke to the donkey. 
The, 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 he spoke back. See, Balaam found a way to get paid. And God judged Balaam. And Balaam's judgment is eternal. Listen, you might find a way to get paid, but here's the thing is, if you do it in a wrong way, the judgment's eternal. The payday is short. Don't go for the short change. Go for the long-term goal of righteousness. He tells us in, in verse 17, These are wells without water, clouds carried by a tempest, for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. See, false teachers only disappoint and frustrate people. It's like being thirsty, you know, it's like you go on a run and you come home and you have like one of those watered sparklet things, you know, with the five gallon things and you, you walk up and you're, oh, water, water, and you hit the button and nothing comes out. Water, water. You ain't going to drink out of the sink here in Arizona, you know what I mean? And so, they, they throw, it, 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 you know, it's like you're thirsty. It's a desert. You're, you want water. And, well, you drop the bucket in. And, well, the only thing you pull out of these prophets is dirt and dust. And it causes your heart to sink. They look and sound so spiritual. And they're like a magnet. People love them. Oh, you know, it's great to be around, you know, oh, people are flocking, you know, if they're flocking, well, there's a lot of people flocking off the bridge, and I ain't following them either. But when you drop your bucket in, all you get is dust. See, they promise to deliver one thing, they promise you the world, and they deliver nothing. They, they, they deliver nothing. They, they, they make promises and commitments, and they always give you the exact opposite of what they're promising. And, and even though they're admired and loved and have huge following, Peter says judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. What else do they do? Look at verse 18. For when they speak, for when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure the lusts of the flesh through lewdness the one who have actually escaped from those who live in error. In other words, they're religious windbags, kind of like me, right? <laughs> who go after those who love the Lord but are not deep in their commitment to the Word of God. See, they quote worldly people and they, they never talk about or expose sin because they don't want to offend anybody. Oh, we, do, we don't want to offend anybody. We want people to come into the church. We want everybody to feel good and, and we want a lot of people in the church and we want a big church and so we dance around God's word and God's commandments and we, we sprinkle a little bit of it in there. You know, we talk about grace and liberty. You know, we'll tell people, hey, if it feels good, go ahead and do it as long as you're sincere about it. I mean, after all, God gave you that desire. But see, my Bible tells me that God says, be holy for I am holy. And my Bible tells me that we're to expose sin and we're to call people to repentance and a holy life. And even though we're called to do that, that doesn't mean we have license to be sin sniffers, to go around looking for people's sin. Look, look what he says at verse 19 as we finish up this morning. And while they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. By whom a person is overcome, by him also is brought into bondage. For if they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and the Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But as it happened to them, according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit, and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire or mud. Now, in other words, their lives don't match up what they teach. Now, it's an interesting thing because what they do is they tell you that light is darkness and darkness is light. That good is actually evil and evil is good. And, and so he draws in this, and he calls it a true proverb, and he says they are actually dogs. Now the thing about creation is a dog is a dog. 
A dog is never a not a dog, and a dog acts like a dog, just like a pig is a pig. A pig is not a human, it's a pig, and a pig acts like a pig. And so, have you ever seen a dog eat something and get sick? Any dog lovers here? They eat something and then they bleh, and then they kind of go off. And they lay down for about 10 or 15 minutes and there's the blah looking there and you're like going bleh, bleh. And then what does the dog do? It comes back and starts eating the stuff that made him sick. I mean, I've seen dogs eat things and lick body parts, and I'm thinking, that dog ain't licking me, never. <laughs> but what Peter is saying here is don't be surprised when a false teacher acts like a false teacher. You know, when, 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 the, when the, the media exposes a false teacher, that means nothing in the church. That's a false teacher being exposed and rejoice in that. Rejoice in that. Why? Because maybe they'll get right. Maybe if they're exposed, they'll get right. And so don't be surprised when a false teacher acts like a false teacher. But what is a false teacher? Well, they're not dressed in red with red horns. In fact, finishing, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14, and we see what a false teacher is. For Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if all his ministers also transfer themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. So you need to know who the Lord is. You need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. You need to know the Word of God. Otherwise, you will be sucked in, chewed up, and spit out. And you, you won't even know it. Know who Jesus is. Amen. Know the Word of God. Amen. Pray, Lord God, baptize me in your Spirit that I won't be deceived. Let me overcome these guys and these worlds and all this stuff. I want to be found doing good Amen. in these last days. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, as we thank you for warnings, for exhortation, for correction, Lord, we ask that you would help us and give us the gift of discernment. Lord, there are so many voices out there, so many people saying, Jesus this and God this and hallelujah. And Lord, we want to know the truth because your word tells us that you are the truth. And if you set us free, if the Son sets us free, we are free indeed. Amen. So Lord, set us free from the lies of the world, the lies of the evil one. Give us a desire to know your word, to know you deeper. Give us a desire to walk with you. And Lord, give us a desire to make those necessary changes that we won't be self-deceived. And Lord, if there's anyone here that has been deceived, that has been drawn away, that, that's trusting in themselves, that's trusting that they know best or better, Lord, I ask that you would bring conviction upon them right now, that you would bring them to repentance, and in the most extreme case, that you would bring them to salvation. Lord, let not one here this day perish, being deceived, believing a lie. Glorify yourself in our midst, we pray now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Shall we stand together?